Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I apologize for being inflicted upon you twice this weekend. I thought perhaps there was another David Boyd that would be appearing on day two, but it turns out that it's me again. So uh, I promise not to re repeat any of my comments from yesterday. I'm here in Fiji wearing my hat as the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Environment, and that, hat, that job really has uh, two main aspects. One is to serve as an advocate for people's right to live in a healthy and ecologically balanced environment, and the other is to serve as a watchdog. And so in my role as an advocate, I present reports to the Human Rights Council and, and the UN General Assembly on an annual basis. In my role as a watchdog, I carry out two country missions each year. And so this is my first country mission to Fiji. It's a real honor, as I said yesterday, to be here. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the intersection of human rights and the environment. I always like to start out by talking about the big picture. You know, we live on the planet Earth. This is the only planet in the universe known to support life. It's an absolute God-given miracle that we are able to live on this beautiful blue-green planet of ours. And the reality is, as many of you know, that we're not doing a very good job of taking care of our home. We have already increased the volume of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere from 280 parts per million prior to the Industrial Revolution to over 400 parts per million today. And the recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change stated in no uncertain terms that we need, quote, rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes at all levels of society if we are, if we are going to avoid catastrophic climate change impacts. In terms of the world's biological diversity, the millions of other species that we share this beautiful planet with, we are causing the sixth mass extinction in the three and a half billion years of life on this planet. Species are going uh, extinct at a, an accelerated rate that scientists believe is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times the natural rate of extinction. And we're also polluting our own homes. We are causing over 8 million premature deaths per year through polluting activities, including 7 million from air pollution alone. And this includes not only outdoor air pollution, which we think about, but also household air pollution from burning fuels within the homes, uh, something which causes over 3 million premature deaths per year, uh, mainly impacting women and children. And these number, some of these numbers I'm citing are abstract. I mean, 7 million people dying a year prematurely because of air pollution. That's 800 people every hour. And each of those individuals has dreams, has hopes, has families, has loved ones. And we have to really remember that human context. I really want to talk to you today about the emergence of a new human right. A human right that really was part of indigenous cultures for thousands of years on Earth, the idea that humans have both rights and responsibilities related to the natural world. The first time this right was ever written down in a legal context was in the Stockholm Declaration, which came out of the world's first big environmental conference held back in 1972, which said that people have the right to live in, a, in an environment that is not detrimental to their health and well-being. And while the Stockholm Declaration was not a legally binding instrument, it was just a political statement, it has had a profound impact on environmental law, human rights law, international environmental law, and constitutional law over the past 45 years. This is a map of the world that shows the countries where the right to a healthy environment has been incorporated into the Constitution, a number that totals over 100 today. And I'm really, I was really delighted in 2013 when Fiji included Article 40 in the Constitution, which says that every person has the right to a, to a clean and healthy environment, including the right to the protection of nature uh, for the benefit of present and future generations. Uh, if there's somebody in this room who has uh, contributed to that, uh, I congratulate you on its uh, beauty and elo the eloquence of that statement. Um, so, uh, over in, and then, then there's also another dozen countries where constitutional courts or Supreme Courts have held that the right to a healthy environment is implicit in the right to life that's in the Constitution. So then if we take countries that not only uh, that have the right to a healthy environment either in their constitutions or in regional human rights treaties or in national legislation, we get 155 of the UN's 193 countries. And I want to pause here and say that there are probably people in this room who act as counsel to other Pacific Island states. Uh, and the right to a healthy environment is not found in the constitutions of the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, um, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvalu, or Vanuatu. 
I'd like to offer right now my services on a pro bono basis. If there's anybody who works with those countries, I would be absolutely thrilled to work with you to bring the right to a healthy environment into those other South Pacific Island legal systems. Um, and the other option would be to do something that Caribbean and Latin American nations have just done. They've just completed a new regional uh, agreement called the Escazú Agreement on the right to information, public participation in decision making, and access to justice in environmental matters. A regional uh, human rights and environmental agreement that 16 countries have signed since it uh, opened for signature in September. We could conceivably do something like that for the South Pacific as well. My predecessor in the role of Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, in his final report to the Human Rights Council, synthesized six years of tremendous work that he had done into a set of framework principles that really define government's obligations in terms of respecting the right to live in a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And I would encourage all of you to have a look at these principles. Um, they're really clear and they're really precise. And my job is to build upon those, that foundation that my predecessor laid by really digging into what does it mean to have the right to live in a clean and healthy environment. And so in my research over the past decade, I've studied, uh, the, studied the, not only the constitutions of these 100 countries where the right to a healthy environment is included, but the impacts of that constitutional recognition. What happens to environmental legislation? What happens in terms of uh, the courts? And most importantly, what happens on the ground in terms of improvements to air quality, drinking water access, and other environmental measures? The right to a clean and healthy environment really has two main components. It has a procedural component and a substantive component. The procedural component is quite straightforward. That is that people have the right of access to environmental information, to participate in environmental decision making that affects their lives or their environment, and to have access to justice and remedies in cases where their right is being threatened or violated. On the substantive side, and this is where my work is really focusing at the United Nations, what, is, what are the substantive elements of the right to a healthy environment? Well, my first report to the Human Rights Council, which will be made in March of 2019, looks at the human right to breathe clean air. I mean, the United Nations General Assembly has passed numerous resolutions on the right to clean water, but they've never passed a resolution on the right to clean air, which I think is a huge oversight, uh, particularly in light of the impacts on the right to life, the right to health that I mentioned earlier. So the right to breathe clean air, the right of access to safe drinking water and adequate sanitation, the right to healthy and sustainably produced food, the right to live in buildings and communities that are free from toxic substances, the right to healthy ecosystems, and the right to flourishing biodiversity. Those are the substantive elements of this right. And from the perspective of Fiji, I just want to give you some examples from other countries around the world of how constitutional recognition of the right to a healthy environment has had a transformative impact on laws, on administrative decision making, on jurisprudence, and on people's lives. So the first impact that I looked at was what's the, what are the impacts on environmental legislation after a country has included the right to a healthy environment in its constitution? In over 85% of those countries that I mentioned, laws have subsequently been amended to incorporate the right to a healthy environment. And those countries have also begun strengthening their environmental law frameworks. So France, for example, they included the right to a healthy environment in their constitution in 2005. They have subsequently passed some of the world's strongest laws in terms of banning fracking, which is an environmentally damaging way of extracting oil and gas. They've banned the use of pesticides on all public lands in France. Um, Costa Rica is another world leader. Costa Rica added the right to a healthy environment to its constitution in 1993. They have now um, got 100% of their electricity coming from renewable sources. They have protected 25% of their land in national parks. They have banned open pit mining. They have banned offshore oil and gas exploration. And I would add that Costa Rica is flourishing economically despite these strong environmental laws or perhaps because of these environmental laws. Um, the other example I want to give you is from Norway, which added, again, added the right to a healthy environment to its constitution in 1992. Norway's, Norway is a major oil and gas producer, but they have the strongest laws in the world governing the oil and gas industry and also extremely high levels of taxation on that industry. So back in the mid-1990s, uh, the oil and gas industry, which in Norway is primarily uh, ocean-based, was dumping thousands of or, sorry, millions of kilograms of toxic substances directly into the ocean from their offshore oil and gas operations. The government of Norway said, we're going to pass a law that requires you to achieve zero disposal of these toxic substances into the ocean. Well, of course, the companies were up in arms saying they couldn't do it, it would be too costly. 
technologically impossible. The Norwegian government went ahead, based on their constitutional right to a healthy environment, they passed the law, and within a decade, those oil and gas companies were fulfilling their legal obligation, and so the rate of disposal went from millions of kilograms to zero over the course of a decade. And at the same time, I would add that Norway has built up a rainy day fund called the Sovereign Wealth Fund of over one trillion US dollars from the taxes and royalties that they have derived from the oil and gas industry. The right to a healthy environment also leads to better administrative decision making. This is a photograph of a beautiful ecosystem in the country of Colombia, which is uh, called the Paramo, and it's a source of drinking water for millions of Colombians. A Canadian mining company wanted to build an open pit gold mine that would have created well, hundreds of jobs in this region. And the Colombian Ministry of the Environment said no, that mine would threaten the constitutional rights to a healthy environment and to drinking water, and they did not permit that mine to proceed. Um, the right to public participation is something that also uh, is enhanced through recognition of the right to a healthy environment. And importantly, the enforcement envir of environmental laws increases dramatically based on the research I've done once you have the constitutional right to a healthy environment. This is an example from Brazil. Brazil put the right to a healthy environment into its constitution in 1988, then passed a series of strong laws, including an Environmental Crimes Act. And this picture is a picture from a Brazilian city called um, Cubatao, which National Geographic magazine called the most polluted city on earth in the 1980s. And within 20 years, it was winning awards as one of the greatest examples in the world of ecological restoration because of the strong enforcement of environmental laws in Brazil. This is another picture from Brazil, an offshore, a spill of oil in the offshore uh, off the coast of Brazil. Brazil came down, the uh, attorney general in Brazil came down with a heavy fist on Chevron, and Chevron was forced to pay 170 million US dollars in fines for what was actually a relatively small oil spill. Now I turn, I know there are some members of the judiciary in the room, I turn to the judiciary's role in protecting the human right to live in a healthy and sustainable environment. And I start in the Philippines where they have, a, like Fiji, they have a very eloquent um, articulation of the right to a healthy environment in the Filipino constitution. In 1993, one of my heroes, an environmental lawyer named Antonio Aposa, or Tony Aposa, brought a lawsuit on behalf of his grandchildren and a group of other Filipino children, arguing that their right under the Filipino constitution to live in a healthy environment was being violated by the uh, clear-cut logging of old growth forests in the Philippines. And in that case, the government tried to have the case thrown out of court, arguing that the children did not have standing. But the Supreme Court of the Philippines, in a very beautiful decision in 1993, said those children do have the right to live in a healthy environment. And that Supreme Court decision led to uh, a law passed in the Philippines uh, in 2000 that prohibits all logging in the, in the remaining old growth forests. Another Filipino case, also brought by Tony Oposa, was uh, led to a Supreme Court decision requiring the government of the Philippines to clean up M Manila Bay, a beautiful wa what was once a beautiful water body adjacent to the capital of the Philippines. Costa Rica again is a place where the constitutional court of the constitutional court has heard literally hundreds of cases on the right to a healthy environment since 1993. Uh, cases that have involved protection of people's drinking water, uh, protection of people's uh, right to breathe clean air and also protection of na the natural world itself. So this was a case where logging was taking place in the habitat of endangered scarlet macaws, and the Constitutional Court said that logging is a violation of the right to a healthy and ecologically balanced environment under the Costa Rican Constitution. Another Costa Rican case actually, which is interesting from a Fijian perspective, actually stopped the development from proceeding on the uh, adjacent to a beach where endangered sea turtles were nesting because scientists believed that the construction of that resort would have an adverse impact on the endangered sea turtles. And these cases are actually happening all around the world with greater frequency. In Europe, over the past three years, there's been a series of uh, decisions in France, the UK, Belgium, Germany, and several other countries that have affirmed that the citizens of Europe have a right to breathe clean air. Uh, and this is probably my, the, my favorite case in 25 years as an environmental lawyer, a case from Argentina where a very courageous public health worker by the name of Beatriz Mendoza filed a lawsuit in 2004 against the federal government, the provincial government, and the municipal government of Buenos Aires, where she lived, arguing that the industrial pollution of the Riachuelo River uh, had violated her and her neighbor's right to live in a healthy environment under the Argentine Constitution. This is one of the most polluted places in South America, and the case went to the Supreme Court of Argentina, and in 2008, the Supreme Court of Argentina issued one of the most powerful judgments I've ever read 
ordering all three levels of government to take concrete and time measured actions to fulfill these people's right to a healthy environment. So things like requiring the governments to uh, collaborate in building drinking water treatment infrastructure, wastewater treatment infrastructure, um, to clean up the banks of the Rio Riachuelo River, to shut down illegal dumps, to conduct businesses of, or conduct in, inspections of polluting businesses. And over the past 10 years, Argentina has invested over 2 billion US dollars in following the order of the Supreme Court. They've built new water treatment infrastructure plants. They've built new uh, water, uh, wastewater treatment plants. They've cleaned up river banks. They've created new parks. And they say that a picture's worth a thousand words. This is a picture of a young boy who had spent his entire life living in a corrugated metal shack on the banks of the Riachuelo River without access to running water or electricity. He's just received the key to a new unit of social housing because of the case that Beatriz Mendoza brought on, on her neighbor's behalf on the right to a healthy environment. So this photograph, to me, epitomizes the power of the right to live in a healthy environment. And as I said, these cases are just uh, building momentum around the world. This is a, a recent decision of the, the Court of Appeal at The Hague in the Netherlands upholding a trial decision which found that the Dutch government is, not, is, is actually violating its citizens' right to life by not taking aggressive action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is a case brought on behalf of a group of children in the United States, the, uh, a case that's still in process uh, called the Juliana case, where the children are arguing that they have the right under the American Constitution to live in a safe climate. And this is a recent, uh, this, this is a group of 25 children and youth from, Colum from Colombia in South America who's, uh, who filed a lawsuit against the Colombian government arguing that deforestation in the Colombian portion of the Amazon rainforest was violating their right to a healthy environment under the Colombian Constitution. They were successful earlier this year in the Supreme Court of Colombia, and the court ordered the government of Colombia to come up with a plan to end deforestation within, <clears throat> excuse me, within four months. Um, in Norway, there's been a case based on the Norwegian right to a healthy environment where Greenpeace and a group of kids have tried to stop offshore oil and gas drilling. They actually lost that case earlier this year at the trial level, but they are appealing. And there are, as I said, there are many cases, too many for me to go through in my limited time with you here today. Um, just, a, just a final note, there's a few additional resources if people want to dig into this issue further. Uh, the website of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, a UN website called Ecolex, and an excellent website at Columbia University on climate litigation. And the last thing I'll say before I uh, adjourn my comments is that human rights are really at the at the heart of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, a set of 17 ambitious goals to transform human society into a sustainable one by the year 2030. And I think that we all need to put our shoulders against the wheel and work together to make sure that no human beings are left behind as we move forward towards a sustainable future. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions.